Perhaps you're looking around and are wondering where a few folks are that you're used to seeing. This is our uh, semi-annual Outback Weekend, which is a fantastic ministry. My wife and daughter went through it this past fall and had a great time. But it's designed for uh, parents and, and teens to go through, but also husbands and wives to go through. So as the storm clouds were coming through earlier, I was really thinking about those guys. We need to continue lifting them up in prayer and the work that God's doing through that wonderful ministry. We talked last week about what a horrific week it was in the United States. But for one man, it was a very surreal experience. 43-year-old Joe Birdie of Austin, Texas, was living out his dream and marking something off the bucket list to finally get to run in the Boston Marathon. And just as he finished running the race, he was looking for his wife, Amy, who was, was right there. And she was there when the first bomb went off, just 10 yards away from where she was standing. And though the person next to her's right leg was taken off, Amy walked away unscathed. Well, in all of the confusion, they couldn't find each other for a long time. And then about an hour later, they found it and re-met up at their hotel. Well, later that night, they went to a memorial service. You can see Joe in the upper left-hand corner there. And after that, on Tuesday morning, they got up and started making their way to the airport. They're going to fly back to Texas, hoping to get their life back in order. And when they landed in Dallas, Amy called another flight onto Austin. And Joe stayed over in Dallas on business. Wednesday afternoon, he hopped in his car and started heading down Interstate 35, heading towards Austin, and just outside of Waco, he saw, saw a big pile of smoke coming up, a big plume of smoke. And so he pulled over and snapped this picture. And moments later, a second, more massive explosion rocked the fertilizer plant. The shock from it threw him back into his car. And he thought to himself, you've got to be kidding. This cannot be happening. And he quickly got back in his car when debris from the large fireball landed on the hood of his car. I got to thinking, Joe Birdie is in need of good news. Amen? And this world is in need of good news. We talked about the hopeless situation that the people in the first century found themselves in last week. We talked about Pilate and the oppressive things that were happening there in Jerusalem and how they were eagerly, as, as Lincoln pointed out, searching for a Savior, searching for someone to deliver them. And the good news came when John mentioned in John chapter 1 and verse 29, John the Baptist said, next day he saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So the apostle John wrote these words down. And many years later, there he is, now in his 90s, and some say he's out on the island of Patmos. And at the very end of his life, he writes this in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 13. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. So in essence, we have the beginning of John's writings and the end of John's writings almost serving as a bookend. And he's saying, what you need to understand is the good news is about the Lamb of God. And as was mentioned earlier, that means something very different to the Jewish people when this was first spoken. For they knew what it was like to raise up and to choose the most perfect Lamb, the one without spot and blemish, that they would set aside and say, this one's going to be for God. This is the one that we will, will raise and someday take to be sacrificed in atonement for our sins. And for John to say, Jesus, this one that's just coming, he is God's sacrifice for us. Well, that's incredible. You know, sometimes we don't think of a lamb as being particularly ferocious or, or scary. But really, it's, it's a perfect analogy to describe Jesus. Because the sacrificial lamb that was not taken, none of his his own accord, but, but Jesus to say, I'm willingly going to be this sacrificial lamb. It's a perfect image of our meek and mild Savior. And it, it was a, a creation in, 
as he was there at, at the very beginning of creation to witness what God's plan was from the very beginning, he knows that at some point he's going to have to step in. And so we have Jesus becomes the very Son of God that's so empty of himself that he can then be filled with the Holy Spirit. He can be guided. and God can use him to take away our sins. So last week we talked about Jesus' secret ambition was the giving away of his life to conquer sins, to heal the broken world, and bring us back to the Father. But at the heart of the Lamb's agenda stands the church. Samuel Rodriguez said this, conceived on the cross, contracted in the empty tomb, and delivered in the upper room, the Lamb's church is a spirit-empowered church. So we're called not to just appreciate the Lamb, but actually to become like the Lamb. And so we are called to kind of die to ourselves and, and kind of take a step back and say, how can we void ourselves of who we are as people? How can we get rid of the ways of the world so that we can be filled more with the goodness of God and carry with us the spirit of the Lamb? Well, unfortunately, the spirit of the Lamb is not the only spirit from Scripture it lives on today. The spirit of Pharaoh is alive and well that's holding people captive in the Egypt of bondage. People that are so convinced that there's no way out of their ad addictions and, and of substance abuse. And they, they feel like that they go through this cycle of, of, of committing this sin and they're saying they're not going to do that and then coming right back again. And so it's this vicious cycle and you see how it's destroying relationships around us and you see all these things but you're convinced that the Spirit holds you captive and that you're going to live out your days being consumed in this sin. The Spirit of Goliath also remains faithful and lives on. The Spirit of Goliath stands there to mock and intimidate the children of God. Good people that allow themselves to be sidelined with, with accusations of intolerance and big, bigotry. And sometimes it's just, it's easier to allow the, the big bully to win the day than to rock the boat. That's the spirit of Goliath that lives on. What about the spirit of Jezebel that is still with us, that's introducing perversions and manipulations into the world and keeping people from becoming the person that God's chosen each one of us to be? And also the, the, the spirit that, that keeps us from experiencing love in, in relationships as God intended. And then we have the spirit of Nebuchadnezzar that still continues to build idols. The spirit of Nebuchadnezzar is right there erecting idols within our culture. And, and it's not just bad things. Sometimes it's good things, like uh, perhaps it's our jobs or, or even you know, the income that comes from that. Or sometimes it's a sports team or, or even our children. Anything that's good that we elevate to the point where it blocks our view of God, that's idolatry. The spirit of Nebuchadnezzar lives on. We also have the divisive spirit of Judea and, and Syntyche that rears her ugly head as dividing homes, dividing churches, and, and dividing communities to where we become a very polarized people. And so this spirit knows that conflict within can distract believers from the real battle at hand. And so that spirit continues on. But what we understand about the spirit of the Lamb is that all of these spirits combined can't hold a candle to the power that comes from Jesus Christ. We know that the most powerful spirit alive is not the spirit of Pharaoh, not the spirit of, of Goliath, not the spirit of Jezebel, not the spirit of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar or even the fighting women in Philippi. No, it's the spirit of the Lamb. It's the most powerful spirit on the planet. It's the spirit of our almighty God. That's what we hold on to. And that's what we believe. And that's what we need to model. Our memory verse card for this week, and I, I hope that you guys are, are taking these and, and spending time with them. But it comes from Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 6. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Let's say that together. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. So we have to realize that these things we're up against, that we, 
we think are, are consuming us or are consuming those around us we care so very much about, it's not by our will. It, it, it's, it, it's not by our, our uh, just trying to do better that's going to help us over these things. It's by the power of God. And as we talked about, we have to believe that, the, that Jesus came not only to save us from our sins, but also to save us from ourselves and to provide us a new path forward, a new way of living life. We're living the life of the Lamb. And whether it was Zerubbabel completing the temple in this passage originally, or this church making a difference in the community, it's not going to come from within. It has to come from the Spirit of God that's empowering us to do this. You know, before Jesus' ascension, Jesus told his disciples this in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. But you will receive. Think of yourself hearing this in, in the presence of Jesus. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria until the ends of the earth. They, they had read the, the scriptures that, that talked about Saul and, and David and, and some of the, the prophets receiving this spirit. It was selective that God had given to, to individual people to help lead his people. He's now saying this spirit is open to all. It's going to happen. And you're not going to be confused as when it comes. We have to believe that same spirit is alive and well in each one of us. It's that spirit that gives us the power to bring good news to the poor, to be instruments of justice and mercy, and empowered to, to witness to the joy that we experience in God's kingdom. We're called to a different people, not from our own, from what we have within us, but from the spirit that embodies us. And we see it all throughout Scripture. God acting boldly with his servants to overcome the, the, the spirits we talked about, read here in Scripture. It was the Spirit of God that emboldened Moses to walk right into Pharaoh's court, the most powerful leader in the entire world at the time, and just walk in and said, I've got a message from God. Let my people go. Just incredible. Spirit of God coursing through his veins. It was a sold-out shepherd boy that, that, that sat on the, on the edge of the hill and, and composed, you know, the Lord is my shepherd. He understood this whole analogy of the sheep. He says, I want to be your lamb. I want to follow you. And so we, we think of kind of a meek and mild person that would write this, but he's the one, when everyone else is shaking their armor, walks right out on the field and says, you better get ready. You come at me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord God Almighty. That's boldness. Boldness where you can put yourself aside and allow God to, to use you as his servant. These are the things that can happen. It was the faithful Elijah that walked up on top of Mount Carmel in the midst of a three-year drought and said, Y'all, all of you that, that brought water up here, get ready, because I'm going to ask you to pour it on the altar. Calls on the name of the Lord God and says, consume this offering in front of 450 prophets of Baal that Jezebel had sent out to do her bidding. And after the fire came and consumed him, he called on the people of the Lord, please go and kill these people. Let's rid ourselves of this sexually laden and religion that that she is, is put together and then he says get ready here comes the rain and it was three young hebrew boys who stood there who stood outside the fiery furnace and nebuchadnezzar says you've got to bow down to this idol or you're going in and they said we're willing to go into here because we have a heavenly father that can save us but even if he doesn't we know he can but even if he doesn't we're not going to bow down to you. That's courage. It was Paul who challenged Yodia and Syntyche to set aside their differences for the sake of the church and the cause of the gospel. He said, it's so important that we live differently, that we can't afford to have these divisions within the church because people are looking at us. People are seeing that you're proclaiming a new way of life. You're proclaiming a new message. It's the message of Jesus. It's the message of the Lamb. It's so important that we're faithful carriers of that. Please set, aside, set those things aside. In each of these cases, the powerful spirit of the Lamb triumphed over the weaker spirits of this world. And we have to believe, no matter what we face, that God is more powerful than the opposition that we're up against. 
I'm sure there's some are saying, well, what does this have to do with dying to self? Well, simply this. The enemy understands that, that the most powerful person and, and human on the planet is not the one with the largest army. It's not the one with, with the most riches or even the most uh, power or, or fame. The most powerful human on the planet is a person set free by the blood of the Lamb. Someone that's so inspired by what Jesus has done for him and understands just how much has been forgiven. That even one sin takes us out of the running to be with our Heavenly Father. That the sin has separated us like Adam and Eve. And now we've been brought back. And once we understand that and understand what Jesus has done for us, oh, then we turn our lives over to God. And at that point, that's when we become dangerous to what Satan wants to do in this world. Our world is so desperate for people that are sold out for Jesus. Can I get amen? We're going up against a lot of stuff. And it's, it's hard to live out. But man, we have got to stand up and say, we believe in, in our Heavenly Father. And no matter what the cost, we are going to be emboldened by what the Lamb has done for us. You know, there's freedom in Christ, but our enemy Satan wants us to be bound by sin. It wants us to be bound by immorality and addiction. Why? Because they're all consuming. And if, if Satan can distract us and, and pull us over here with some different things, then we can't be God-consumed. And that's what God's calling us to. You know, our, our enemy wants us to focus on depression and loneliness, anxiety, and fear to just, just grip us and consume our thoughts. Because if we're in that place, and we're so consumed by what's happening around us, what might happen in this area, we can't be God-consumed. Our thoughts can't be on what He's done for us, and our thoughts also can't be on others. We just get wrapped up in our own little world. We've got to be so inspired by what God has done for us that we can't help but go out and help others. I had a roommate in college that had an aversion to test-taking. And the night before his big exams, it it was just all-consuming. So instead of being in there studying, he was in the restroom with stomach cramps and and nausea, and it it just wasn't pretty. But he was so consumed with the idea that he was going to fail, instead of being consumed with, this is what I need to do to succeed. And so it became a self-fulfilling prophecy. The spirits of old continue to thrive, and they're taking new prisoners daily around us in this world. And it's time for the church to be the church, to get the world out, to get the word out to the world, and to offer a ray of hope, to show people that we're different, not because we're better, but because Jesus is better, because his spirit is more powerful. In the early 20th century, communist leaders declared that by the 21st century, the entire world would embrace communism, and there would not be one Christian alive on planet Earth. In the 1930s, Nazi officials declared that the Third Reich would outlast the Christian faith. And in the 1960s, the Beatles declared that they were more popular than Jesus Christ. Well, how those statements turned out, it's 2013. Stalin is entombed, Hitler is dead, and John Lennon has passed, the one that said that, those words. And today, we're declaring that the church of Jesus Christ is alive and well and this is the answer that God put forth to carry the message of Jesus Christ. And the church has got to be the church to stand up to what we've been called to do. You know, if, if we're going to embody the spirit of the Lamb, then we've got to embrace the whole idea and the agenda of the, the Lamb, which is to die to ourselves. In Revelation chapter 12, describes the final victory over Satan, which is called the great dragon. Revelation 12 and verse 10 says this, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers who accuses him before our God day and night has been hurled down. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. That's how he was destroyed. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. That's how important this is. This is not just kind of a personal thing where I hope to kind of get rid of some stuff so I can be a little closer to God. No, 
We can't live up to being his followers in the church unless we're willing to die ourselves and live for Christ, for Christ to be gained. That's what he's calling us to. Matthew 16 and 24. If anyone would come after me, he must design, deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. When we start thinking about the cross, it has kind of a, a vertical and then it has a horizontal cross member. If you think about it, that's very true about our relationship with God. We have a vertical connection with our Heavenly Father, but we also have a horizontal aspect of our faith. So we spend time with our Heavenly Father. We're also reaching our left and our right hand to the community around us. That's what we're called to do. So in, in essence, we embrace those around us when we experience both redemption, but then we also have relationship. We have holiness between us and God, but we also come before people in, in humility. We have covenant relationship with God we experience, we come to him and, and give our lives over in baptism. That's covenant. But we also experience community. It's not just a one-time thing between us and God. We also have righteousness and, and holiness, but we also experience justice and, and are, are attempting to do that in the world around us. And we have salvation. Hopefully, we're also bringing about transformation. See, if we don't have the, the vertical aspect, then we're just serving uh, uh, under our own power. And that never works out. We, we become fatigued, we become irritable, because pe people are difficult. But on the other hand, if we just say we're going to be a community, that's all about worship, and, and, and that's my, my one hour of the week is going to be what I do between me and God, well then, it becomes self-serving. And it becomes a, a part where we're just sealing ourselves off from the world. And we're not taking our are called serious to be salt and light, to be these difference makers in the world around us. Revelation chapter 5, verse 6 through 9 says, Then I saw the Lamb, looking as if he had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders, and they sang a new song. The world around us is desperate for a new song to be sung by the church. The world is desperate hear the message of Jesus Christ and the world is changing and the church must rise to meet the needs of this world you know the church has to be about being the people of the lamb living out a holistic gospel to where when people see us and see the things that we're doing we're trying the best we can and, and as broken vessels to be Christ in different situations that need a Christ filled person in that situation it's hard to do so we have holy hands that are lifted up in worship, but also helping hands that are stretched out to those that are in need. You can't have one without the other. Earlier this week, Donald Adair, the owner of the West Fertilizer Company, held a press conference to express his sympathy to the 14 people that lost their lives, including the 10 first responders that went in who were trying to protect the town of West Adair went on to thank the community that's really rallied together and those from, from different parts of Texas that have come in to help them. But then, in the middle of, of his press conference, he especially, he especially thanked the West Church of Christ that opened their doors into to the state of Texas to provide grief counseling to those that are in need. That's the testimony that I want to get out, that we care about people, that we've been so changed by what Jesus has done in us we want to make a difference and help people in their time of need. You know, we began this lesson by presenting that this world is in need of hope. This world is in need of good news. And we die to self and empty ourselves, and God can fill us up with that good news, and we can embody it as Jesus did, walking in different situations. So it's the good news of Jesus Christ. It's also the good news of the Lamb. Let's pray together. Lord, as we look around, it's not hard to see this world is desperately in need of good news. Lord, we know that the spirit of Pharaoh and Goliath and Jezebel, Nebuchadnezzar and Beauty and Synthache are alive and well. But Lord, so is the spirit of the Lamb. Lord, help us to be bold. 
Lord, help us to confront evil when we see it. Lord, help us to be there, to standing with those who are struggling with addiction. Lord, help us to be there with our hearts and with our hands and with our pocketbooks to help those in need. Lord, help us to, to guide those back that have lost their way. Lord, I, I pray that when we encounter people that the world says are our enemies, I pray that we can surprise them with our humility. I pray that we can surprise them with our love. Lord, I hope we can surprise them with our willingness to serve and go the extra mile. Lord, to do that, we must die to ourselves. Help us to do that so that more of your son Jesus can live and breathe and minister through us, not for our benefit or, or for our recognition, but Lord, for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen.